Bene, buonasera a tutti. Good evening, everybody. We start our event entitled... Well, I have an old one, actually. I'm not sure this is the right title. So, well, Islam, Constitution and Democracy. These are the key words of our title. I don't know in which order. In an article that was published a few weeks ago by Professor Tania Groppi, who is one of our panelists today, Professor Groppi asked the following question. What is left of the Arabian Spring? Well, this question is uh, really controversial at the moment because uh, in recently this question has been asked with uh, increasing astonishment and surprise in front of uh, the news uh, of the last days. Well, we know that uh, Arabian Spring is uh, a concept that is part of the history, of our history. And um, I say this for our Italian friends. The Treccani Encyclopedia has decided to include these words, Arab Spring, because uh, it is uh, something that uh, will uh, remain uh, fixed in history. No one can forget the wave of hope that started five years ago from the southern uh, shore of the Mediterranean and spread over our uh, democracies uh, to show that there is a string, still a strong hunger for uh, freedom in our neighboring countries. A continent like Europe that is, has always seen a sacrifice for freedom and democracy only as an ancient memory, mass media showed young people, girls and boys, that not far from us are fighting and dying for those values that we have uh, problems in remembering. So this is a great hope for everyone. But again, a lot of problems started soon afterwards. Do we really understand what is happening in these countries? Are we really understanding what's happening now after the Arab Spring? One of my greatest friends who participated in uh, the Arab Spring, our friend Walid Farouk, has always uh, noticed this difficulty we have in the West in understanding what happens in the Arab world. And, uh, well, may maybe the expression Arab Spring is quite strange because only for... Uh, uh, Western people, spring is uh, the beginning of uh, a good season that uh, is the reawakening of nature, whereas people living in Africa know that the spring is the beginning of a very difficult season. So an Arab uh, would never talk about spring if uh, they wanted to, to define something positive. So are we really understanding what's happening? Or did we just uh, project our um, desires, our wishes on what we were uh, witnessing? Understand, uh, understanding something means to uh, really be involved, but we are not always ready to lose something because uh, we want to know more. And in Europe and in America, everything changed in terms of what happened back. Because after the spring, there was uh, the uh, hot uh, and uh, um, 
arid uh, summer of Africa. So this is one of the causes of uh, refugee flows uh, that uh, uh, we are now experiencing. So our uh, democracy, our uh, limited freedom uh, that uh, makes us uh, think that if we have to pay a price uh, for uh, other people's democracy, maybe we would prefer dictatorship. We cannot uh, accept this uh, short seeing and uh, uh, well this is our main problem we are looking at what happens but these countries uh, seem so far away that everything is confused and uh, the great opportunity the meeting gives us is uh, uh, to uh, fill this gap and uh, to uh, create a dialogue um, with the people who live these, uh, who experience firsthand uh, these events. So I would like to to um, I would like to start with the question uh, by Professor Groppi, what's left of uh, the Arab Spring? And I ask these questions to our uh, uh, guests and friends who I have um, who accepted our invitation to come here to the meeting. Three of uh, these guests come from uh, three countries that are a symbol of uh, this great transformation in uh, Northern Africa, Tunisia, Egypt, and Turkey. These are key uh, countries in uh, the phenomenon we have called uh, Arab Spring. Tunisia, that's where everything started in January 2014, adopted a new constitution and uh, immediately after it uh, seems to have, be have become uh, uh, the victim of tourism and then Turkey with the election in June 2015 that created a new, a new majority that could uh, um, lead to another fall of the parliament. And this is is another crucial country for the international uh, scenario. And then Egypt, which has always been a, a pivotal country in the Mediterranean, and the uh, Arab uh, Spring, the events of the Arab Spring in uh, um, the Tarab Square are uh, actually very important for the whole of the events of the Arab Spring. Then. Uh, so we have Professor Adel Omar Sharif, who is the Vice President of the Constitutional Court of Egypt, who is a judge in this court, and he is also Professor of Constitutional um, Right, and uh, he is a visiting professor in many different uh, universities in Northern America and in Europe, and he is a scholar in uh, family right and constitutional right. Thank you for being with us. Professor Rafa Benashur, who is also Professor of Constitutional Right uh, of the University Post Romani, pensiamo che Cartagine sia stata distrutta. Of Cartagine, which is important to remember, has not been destroyed as we have read in the Bible, and it has its own university as well. So he's Professor of Constitutional Right, but he had a long political career, he was a minister um, and he was a vice premier and is the founder of the Association for Constitutional Right in uh, Tunisia and also a judge of the African Court for Human Rights. Thank you for being with us. Our third guest is Ibrahim Kaboglu, who is professor of uh, Constitutional right of the University of Marmara in, in Istanbul, and he is uh, one of the main participants in the public debate uh, that is particularly uh, alive at uh, this moment on uh, the uh, protection of rights. Thank you, thank you, Professor Kaboglu. Um, as you know. If we want to overcome our uh, short-sightedness, uh, sometimes uh, we need uh, a pair of glasses, uh, we need lenses that make uh, things clearer to our vision. So uh, apart from our uh, uh, guests uh, that I have already mentioned, we have invited uh, a good friend and a colleague, 
one of uh, the uh, most uh, important uh, experts uh, of uh, comparative uh, constitutional right in Europe uh, that knows very well these countries. Uh, her latest book uh, um, is entitled uh, Tunisia, the uh, Spring of uh, the uh, um, Constitution, and her name is Tanya Gropi. She's professor at the University of Siena. So I'll, uh, I would like to ask uh, Professor Gropi uh, to uh, help us uh, to um, approach this uh, topic. So, uh, well, Professor Gropi, you have the word. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you. Thank you all for being here today, this uh, evening. And I must say this is really comforting for me. And I'd like also to thank uh, the, my colleagues, uh, uh, the uh, um, other panelists uh, that are here this evening. I don't know if I can provide it, uh, you with uh, uh, the right lenses to overcome this uh, short-sightedness, uh, but I try to, I'll try uh, to start uh, from uh, a, a reflection that uh, uh, was uh, uh, part of the message of uh, the President Sergio Mattarella, the message to the meeting. In his message, uh, President Mattarella said, uh, with great courage, I must say, and I quote uh, the words of uh, President Mattarella, terrorism fed by fanatism uh, that change our faith in God is trying to introduce uh, in the Mediterranean, in Africa and in the Middle East uh, the seeds of a third world war. So it is our responsibility to stop it. So this uh, is uh, the uh, questions I would like to tackle here today. There are many questions I'd like to ask to, to ask our guests, our uh, um, experts, our uh, uh, judges that are here with us. So this is what I would like to, to ask them. Uh, how constitutionalism can help in this fight? What can uh, democracy uh, contribute uh, um, what can this constitutionalism uh, do to stop fanatism and terrorism? So the heart of uh, uh, um, the uh, constitutionalism was born after World War II, based on uh, international treaties, on human rights, on uh, contemporary constitutions. Constitutions is based on the, the centrality of uh, uh, the human being as the president said in his message. So the dignity of uh, human, beings, in, human beings and uh, um, their uh, rights that have to be respected by everyone, by the state, by the uh, democratic majorities that govern our countries. So this uh, constitutionalism, uh, just to give a few uh, definitions, the constitutionalism after World War II tells us that around these values embedded in our constitutions are the basis for a pact that keeps pluralistic societies united. So these elements of this society and its different components can then develop their own life projects. So, so this uh, um, reflection that goes beyond the Constitution and uh, that uh, uh, well uh, includes other words uh, that we have in the title, we don't know exactly the order, but. Islam, democracy, and constitutions are the words of our uh, title for our uh, conference tonight. So, I will uh, try to develop this uh, theme on two different levels. Uh, a level that is external to our uh, uh, Western uh, countries where uh, constitutional democracy was born. So, something that is outside our region that will uh, give us the opportunity to 
see what constitutional democracy can offer to countries that have a Muslim majority. And then another level, which is an internal level uh, in, the, in the Western countries, that should tell us whether we are really actually exploiting all the opportunities uh, that uh, constitutional democracy gives us in order to uh, live in our multicultural societies and uh, to um, live together with uh, Muslims in our societies. So we have two different uh, levels, an external level that uh, looks at uh, um, Muslim countries and the level that uh, uh, regards Western countries. And uh, the two aspects are actually interwoven. And I quote President Mattarella, democracy, he says at the end, can be exported uh, through example and culture. So we um, cannot uh, uh, treat these two levels separately. And uh, there are a couple of other uh, thoughts I'd like to share with you. A starting point uh, that I believe uh, uh, is uh, unavoidable is that constitutional democracy in the countries where it has been implemented since 1945, um, well, it has proved itself to be a good thing. It is a tool, it is an institutional uh, organization that uh, produces peace in the country where it is applied and in the relationships between nations. So this is my starting point. And uh, oh, we have not uh, yet found any other institutional structure that gives the same results. So that's my personal starting point. A second starting point, well, I'm a professor of constitutional law, uh, of uh, comparative uh, institute, constitutional uh, law. I'm not an expert in Islam or uh, in Muslim countries. So that's my personal point of view. And my experience uh, is uh, limited uh, to the activity uh, for uh, the uh, constitutional activity in Tunisia. Having said this, uh, I'd like to start uh, uh, with uh, the external level of our theme. As Andrea Simoncini was uh, saying, I believe we now have a, an extraordinary opportunity to better understand what is going on in these uh, three countries that are very different from, from the other, but are uh, um, all crucial. And as Andrea said, uh, you uh, all understand uh, this question, the need to find a, an answer. Probably this is the reason why you are here. What is left? of the Arab Spring, of all the movements uh, that uh, um, we saw five, uh, four years ago. At the beginning of 2011, the countries of uh, Northern Africa and the uh, Middle East that were still outside uh, the uh, great transition to democracy of uh, the 1990s of uh, Latin America and uh, uh, Western and Eastern Europe after 1989, well, all these countries seem to have started their own uh, process. We have the impression that these people uh, wanted to create uh, the, a new institutional system. And in uh, these uh, regions, uh, there were uh, authoritarian uh, uh, regimes supported by uh, Western countries. And after 9-11, uh, uh, after, uh, uh, this uh, support uh, had been further strengthened. And uh, the experts of uh, Arab Springs uh, told us uh, that uh, these regimes uh, were based uh, on uh, um, uh, some kind of a social uh, uh, agreement uh, that uh, well could guarantee a certain level of uh, welfare. And in 2011, uh, uh, these uh, revolutions uh, were uh, the result of uh, a situation that uh, had uh, um, evolved during the years. There were different problems. There was also the global economic crisis. So there are uh, many studies. What I'm telling you is uh, just a summary. Um, apart from the 
causes, which are uh, obviously extremely important uh, to understand uh, the uh, following uh, development. Well, what is most uh, astonishing, uh, the, what makes us ask ourselves uh, what happened, is the result of uh, the uh, Arab Spring. Uh, to prepare my intervention, I read some uh, texts that were written in 2011, 12, 13, and the distance uh, that separates us uh, from um, those events and the interpretation we gave of those events uh, is enormous. We were comparing the indignados of Madrid uh, that after uh, the economic crisis uh, were asking for uh, uh, more uh, social rights with what was happening in uh, Egypt, in El Cairo, in uh, uh, Tahrir Square. Well, this comparison today uh, it doesn't seem to be realistic. Because today we have a different impression. I don't know whether I'm, I'm wrong. Maybe each of us uh, has a different perception of what happened. But anyway, uh, we have uh, the feeling that uh, the majority of those movements actually did not uh, give many results. And apart from the most dramatic uh, cases uh, where uh, a civil war broke out uh, or, uh, for instance, where we have terrorism like in Libya and Syria, apart from those uh, extreme cases, uh, in many of these countries, we have the impression that they have uh, gone back to the previous regime and that uh, these movements actually uh, were of benefit only for uh, uh, the uh, Islamic world. Uh, that is to say, those political movements that uh, uh, more or less openly wanted to impose uh, Islam as su the supreme law of the state. Because apart from what uh, the people asked in the uh, in the streets, uh, that is to say, dignity and more equality also from an economic point of view. What actually happened afterwards uh, in Egypt, in Tunisia, but maybe also in uh, Turkey, where uh, the uh, party of Erdogan uh, took advantage of uh, the democratic opening of the 90s uh, to uh, establish itself as uh, the governing party. In the first democratic elections, we saw the uh, we saw uh, that uh, Islamic uh, movements and parties won. So. Uh, if these parties don't have uh, the goal uh, to change the uh, state uh, into an Islamic state, uh, once they are arrive, when they, once they have the power, they start to change uh, the society that uh, on the very, very long run could uh, result into an institutional transformation of the state. So, well, these events uh, reinforce the idea that democracy is not compatible with Islam, because a democracy with its opening to pluralism, once uh, that uh, um, free elections are introduced, cannot avoid uh, the um, victory of Islamism. So, in a way, uh, we have the impression that only authoritarian regimes can avoid that Islamic countries go through this uh, kind of process and maintain a certain neutrality, so to speak. Tunisia seems to be an exception. It is a country that uh, managed I wanted to do I want to dwell too long on this, even though there is uh, so many things that we could uh, we could say. So I was saying it is a country that uh, approved a democratic uh, uh, constitution um, that uh, is in line uh, with the constitutional democracy standards, uh, with uh, a uh, process uh, that uh, was really shared and uh, was based by, on a consensus among the different political parties. The pre the first. Uh, Elections were uh, won by uh, the Inanna party, but then this party had to uh, negotiate with all the other parties. The civil society participated as well. Then the constitution came into force, elections uh, took place, and almost all the organs, uh, the bodies uh, foreseen by these, uh, this democratic constitution are now functioning. 
So, well, this, this is in itself an exception. But if we take a look, a closer look to what is happening in the latest uh, weeks and uh, months in Tunisia, well, Tunisia has become a primary objective, uh, uh, maybe really due to this uh, uh, successful transition, but it has uh, also shown its vulnerability. Constitutional democracy, the pact that has been uh, achieved, uh, this uh, balance uh, between uh, the protection of the safeguard of human rights, pluralism, the role of Islam, this pact is really very fragile, and this is the, the, the core question I would like to ask to my colleagues here. The society of Tunisia, as well as the societies of other Muslim countries, is divided. Uh, there is a, a gap uh, in terms of values. So, uh, well, it has been written that many, in many Muslim countries, uh, there is a certain um, uh, space time gap. People would like to live in a different era, in a different epoch, in the Middle Ages. Then there is a part of the population, laymen, who would like to live somewhere else as well, in the West. These two worlds have problems in finding a common ground, and uh, um, Islam thus finds uh, the uh, way to uh, um, attract people, attract young people. Uh, let's think about what happened in Tunisia, the number of young, young people that uh, fight uh, with ISIS, for instance. And this can only be explained uh, through the fact that younger people are uh, missing something there. And here I quote another interesting document, the social pact against uh, terrorism approved uh, on uh, August the 13th by a council of uh, 1,000 Tunisian scholars uh, that says that these young people lack uh, a project for the future. So lack again, this is a word that comes out again and again. So even the exception of Tunisia with uh, the perfect constitution that, that is in line with uh, uh, the uh, constitutional standards uh, has this uh, great vul vulnerability. So, well, and this is the question uh, that um, our uh, guests are called upon to answer. Is this really the case? Uh, in constitutional democracy is really so fragile if uh, confronted with Islamism. It is uh, really true that it cannot to activate the resources of society that can defend pluralism. Are there some forces capable of reaction in uh, Islam, uh, Islamic countries? Women, ra human rights activists are there, and that is something we already know. But can this involve also other layers of the populations outside the cities, in rural areas, so can we really start that social pact that can be the only chance to have a successful constitutional democracy? Or should we look for different solutions? And constitutional democracy as we know it after World War II is not enough, is not the right solution because there is this lack of... of constitutional public opinion, uh, this force of a society that should believe in the values of pluralism. And I conclude by speaking about our societies in the West, Italy, uh, the other European countries that live in constitutional countries, states, the role of our, of our constitutions in this fight against terrorism and fundamentalism. So uh, there is uh, not only the problem of double standards uh, and uh, so the ambiguity of the West uh, that uh, um, makes deals uh, with the terrorists that doesn't really make uh, an effort against, uh, against the terrorism. This is something we know, unfortunately. But um, our colleague, uh, uh, Will Farouk, uh, 
uh, says that in our countries, in Europe, we have uh, 20 million European Muslims uh, that are Westerners, just like uh, ourselves, uh, but they are, are they invisible? So there is only um, a false integration. And uh, uh, if Europe is really loyal to pluralism and constitution, should make these uh, citizens as visible as other uh, uh, citizens in their governments, in their political parties, the universities, the first, uh, uh, the front line against, uh, uh, the, against ISIS are European Muslims. So we talk about uh, a pluralistic democratic state in the West, but we have not actually exploited all the opportunities offered by pluralism to create here in the West something that is Western and Muslim at the same time. So I believe we still have a, a lot of opportunities uh, we have not exploited yet in Europe, at least. And now we will uh, uh, listen to our guests and see whether we have the same opportunities in Muslim countries to react uh, to uh, the attack against uh, pluralistic democracy. Well, I believe that events like this one uh, can contribute to uh, be uh, ready, to be always on alert, uh, and uh, uh, because uh, we do not want uh, uh, to uh, be um, people who do not take their own responsibilities. I cannot say I do not, uh, uh, I'm not responsible for what is happening somewhere else because this kind of attitude is causing pain to humanity. So um, we really need to explore all these opportunities through dialogues and through meetings. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. Professor Benashur, you have the floor. Thank you, dear colleagues. I'd like, first of all, to thank the organizers for inviting me to this meeting. And thank you for uh, preparing a meeting on this uh, subject that it's extremely interesting. Uh, this uh, subject really seems to raise a lot of worries. I see that there's a big audience this evening with us. And Mr. President, I uh, had planned to talk about uh, Islam constitutions and democracy. However, after listening to my distinguished guest, uh, Professor Groppi, and I would like to thank her because uh, uh, in a way she contributed to my invitation here. I would like to go back to uh, a number of uh, points that uh, have been raised in her presentation. I would also like to uh, specify uh, some points, in particular for the many young people who are present in this room and who represent the future of Europe they represent the future of the world, and they uh, also represent the future of the Mediterranean Basin. First of all, I would like to uh, specify something about this notion of Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, as such, has been acknowledged officially, and uh, I am among uh, those people uh, who uh, rise against this definition and uh, do not accept this notion of Arab Spring. And why is it so? Because this uh, expression is a sort of uh, easy way, it's a kind of loophole and it's uh, an oversimplification of a highly complex reality. There is no Arab Spring. There has been a beginning of Tunisian Spring. However, in the other 
Arabian countries that are 23, there has been um, a gloomy weather, um, a damp weather. A, a kind of storm was about to approach, so we had no sprouts uh, really giving us the idea that spring was about to come. There was a windy weather and there were no flowers blossoming uh, in the pipeline in 2011 for heads of states, of Arab states, left the international arena after uh, demonstrations that came from the bottom. Tunisian President Ben Ali, Egyptian President Mubarak, Libyan leader Mohammed Gaddafi, because, well, he, that's the way he was termed, leader, and then the Yemenite president, Ali Abdallah Saleh. These four countries today have uh, certain situations. In two of them, there is a war a really serious war. Every day there is countless victims there. And so in two of those uh, countries we can say that the state is, does not exist anymore. And in Libya uh, the state has even disappeared. Unfortunately, we may not expect that uh, a, a new state may be established uh, like tomorrow. And as regards our Algerian brothers, and uh, for sure my colleague uh, Omar Sharif will talk about that in detail, the situation is still difficult and uh, Egypt has not found a balance yet. Even if uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, was set aside the uh, political scenario and the political power. So I really don't understand why people talk about an Arab Spring. I would also like to emphasize that uh, the phrase spring, the term spring, has often been used by journalists. In 1969, for example, there was the Prague Spring. After that, there was uh, uh, winter all of a sudden. There was no summer. And even uh, in Tiananmen Square, there was reference to spring. Well, that was really short uh, spring, a one-day spring. So why are we using this kind of loophole? Why are we using this phrase? Well, this is a kind of uh, slogan that may become a tourist uh, logo. Uh, was there a jasmine revolution? No, there was no jasmine revolution. In Tunisia there was a revolution of freedom and dignity. And that's something that has uh, a totally different uh, texture compared to jasmine. The, even if the flowers are beautiful and they have a beautiful smell, but the smell only lasts 24 hours. Then uh, I would like also to specify one more point, and that concerns uh, terrorism. You know very well that uh, uh, terrorism, well, even Itali our Italian friends maybe know this much better than anybody else, you know that terrorism has no nationality and no religion. Our host country today has experienced uh, terrorism. Italian democracy was uh, hit, profoundly hit, by terrorism. 
Italy experienced the ideological terrorism of uh, the Red Brigades, the Brigata Rossa in Italian, and it experienced the uh, terrorism of gangsters that caused the deaths of uh, hundreds of people, including many prosecutors and magistrates. For this reason, it's not possible to talk about uh, Islamic or other forms of terrorism. In all religions, there is uh, integralists, there is uh, violent people, and people who are tolerant. So I don't really want to teach European people a class about uh, all the tragedies and horrors that were perpetrated in the name of uh, religions. And, Mr. President, I would like to uh, specify a, th a further point. This is um, uh, a difference I would like to point out, a distinction that might sound difficult, but there's this distinction between Islam, which is a monotheistic religion, so a religion that emerged in the 7th century after death, and then in Islamism, which is a political doctrine. And this political doctrine uses religion for political purposes. And this way, they use uh, the uh, religious factor as a um, key to trigger emotions that are part of human beings. And in this way, so using this key, one can be sure that many, many people can be reached. As a consequence, Islamism is not uh, the doctrine of all Muslim people. I am a Muslim and I am proud of it. And I live very well my Muslim religion, but I'm not Islamist at all. I don't accept Islamism and I fight against it. I haven't finished yet, Mr. President. I have a further point, if I may, which concerns constitutionalism. Constitutionalism is a political doctrine, a legal doctrine. It is political insofar as it refers to an idea of freedom, but it also a legal doctrine, insofar it takes on a specific legal form, which is that of a constitution. And constitution is the supreme norm, the one which and I quote Jean-Jacques Rousseau, is the so-called social contract. If we uh, create a link between these concepts, that is Islam, constitutions and democracy, we can understand that we are talking about 
three three concepts that belong to different eras. Islam emerged in the seventh century before Christ. Democracy emerged in the fifth century before Christ with the century of Pericles. And finally, the constitution that emerged in the 18th century is if we consider the American constitution of 1787 as the first manifestation of constitutionalism. So constitutionalism and democracy did not really uh, walk, uh, go on side by side. They were not uh, being developed at the same time. The former countries of the Soviet Union that pretended to be democratic and they wanted them to be called popular democracies had constitutions. As a consequence, the relation between liberal democracy and uh, constitution has not always been established in hi in hi throughout history. So finally, Mr. President, since I come from Tunisia, I cannot talk but about the Tunisian constitution that was uh, adopted on the 27th of January 2014. I would like to emphasize that uh, Tunisia already has a long constitutional history, a long constitutional tradition. So this is a tradition that started off uh, with an intellectual movement of reformers and then at, in the legal terms this expressed itself with the adoption of a declaration of a rights that is called the Fundamental Pact. Four years later, this Fundamental Pact of 1857 was followed by the first constitution of the Arab world, the Tunisian constitution of the 26th of April, 1861. In 1920, the first political party of the Arab world was called Destur, and that means constitution. So that was the uh, Liberal Constitutional Party of Tunisia. And in 1934, there was uh, a renewal in this uh, party that was named Neo Destur. After that, there was the uh, Tunisian Constitution of the 1st of June, 1959. Now I'll make a time leap in history as I've been told that I only have three minutes left. So let's, I thought I had still had seven minutes actually. I agree with what our colleague Professor Groppi said as Tunisia today is an exception. It is an exception and Morocco must be added to that exception. Currently, these are the two Arab countries the two Arab countries that managed to fulfill a democratic transition. 
the Tunisian constitution was uh, difficult to, to uh, put forward because initially the first attempt was that of uh, making a theocratic uh, constitution but uh, thanks to resistance expressed by Tunisian people in this respect and in particular thanks to resistance uh, uh, performed by uh, Tunisian women it was thanks to the resistance of the whole civil society in Tunisia that uh, this uh, theocratic constitution was not adopted So, the so-called project of uh, June 2013, for example, in one of the articles, it established that uh, uh, the woman is the counterpart of men. But uh, what was not specified is that if the uh, complement was a uh, direct or indirect object or a nominal complement or an adverbial complement and so on. So the whole grammar was really open there for choices. Mr. President, I'm going to get to the conclusion. To conclude, I would like to quote uh, three articles, only three articles. Well, three articles out of 148 making up the Tunisian constitution. Article 6. I would like to read it, uh, if uh, I may. I don't think this is a common article in contemporary constitutions. This article uh, talks about the state and reads, the state protects religion and guarantees freedom of worship, of conscience, and uh, the practice of cults. And in item two, it also reads that the state shall defend the values of moderation and uh, tolerance. And then I would also like to read uh, Article 46. Many democratic countries dream dream about a country like uh, an article like this, Article 46. What is uh, this article? Well, this article reads the state, the state shall protect the rights of women, the acquired rights of women, and shall strengthen and promote these rights. Also, the state shall accomplish equality between men and women. In Tunisia, in the elections, political parties are forced to present the candidates that take part there, alternating men with women, so they should show their candidates mixing men and women, one man, one woman, one, man, one, man, one woman, and so on. And finally, Mr. President, I would like to read Article 49. This article was directly inspired by the International Agreement on uh, Political Rights and Civil Rights. And uh, Article 49 reads that no attack against freedom and no attack against uh, rights shall be uh, admitted 
with the exception of those cases in which they may be uh, proportionally necessary and all this shall take place under the control of the Constitutional Court. Thank you, Mr. President. I had prepared a completely different presentation, but I decided just to say something different. Thank you so much. Grazie. Grazie, professor. Thank you, thank you, Professor Benashur. Professor Ibrahim Kaboglu, you have the word. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm really happy to be here with you tonight here in Rimini. this uh, session devoted to Islam, Constitution, and Democracy. My speech has the following title, Constitutional Democracy in Turkey. But obviously, well, Turkey is a country with a specific characteristics. It is a European country, but at the same time it is a country of the Middle East. So what is the special character of Turkey? Well, Turkey is a very unique country that managed to put together Islam and democracy thanks to its late according to article number two of the constitution the Republic of Turkey is uh, a um, democratic state uh, that is light, so, uh, lay, social and respectful of human rights. I will now talk about four different aspects in my intervention. First of all, um, there will be an introduction. To, well, just uh, give you an overview of the history of Turkey. Then I will be talking about human rights and then uh, of the political regime. And then I will be talking about the situation of Turkey in the constitutional uh, time and space. That is to say, I will talk about constitutionalism in Turkey and at the same time in the Mediterranean region. The Republic of Turkey is founded on the concept of nation state and on the principle of laity. The country of more than Turkey is the result of a process of transformation from uh, a multinational empire to a nation state and at the same time from a multi-confessional empire to a lay country, a lay state. The completion of uh, this process uh, took place in 1920. After uh, the movement for uh, national independence, the Lausanne Treaty was signed in 1923, which enabled Turkey to become an independent country. But this country also enabled Turkey, Turkish citizens that were not Muslim to have a uh, religious minority status. After the Ottoman Empire, Turkey had five great constitutions. 
the first one, 1886. It's 1876 uh, with the Ottoman Empire. The second constitution was the founding constitution of 1921. And then it's another constitution of 1924. And one in 1961. It's the, the latest is the constitution of 1982. To, which is the current constitution actually, which is at, uh, in force at the moment. So, what are the characteristics of uh, these constitutions? I don't want to dwell on the details, uh, but uh, I'd like um, to remind you some aspects linked with the human rights. So, what are the characteristics? of uh, uh, these uh, constitutions um, and then I will talk about um, the political regime of Turkey. From the human rights point of view, I have to say that uh, the state of Turkey is a funding member of the Council of Europe. Um, as uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Robbie, was uh, talking about uh, constitutionalism after uh, World War II, the internationalization of human rights um, concerns also the internationalization of constitutional rights. And my country also adopted these. Uh, so officially, Turkey is a European state. From the point of view of human rights that are considered as the legal infrastructure of democracy, our constitution adopts An approach that is closer to the liberal constitution. This in terms of human rights as well as of the political regime. For 25 years, some reforms have been carried out in the field of human rights. reforms of uh, the text of the Constitution that uh, the Constitution had actually introduced uh, some restrictions in terms of human rights, then we reformed our Constitution. So what was the result of these reforms on human rights? First of all, there has been a consolidation of uh, constitutional freedoms and rights. Moreover, we have a, a, juris, a clear jurisdiction of human rights because we have tried to create a human rights status that was in line with that of the European Union. And then there was uh, the interna internationalization of human rights in case of a conflict uh, between national law and international law on human rights, the international law prevails. So that's the one that has to be applied and not the national law. In Turkey, the rule of law was uh, created, established, thanks to the preceding constitution in 1961. Our constitution, our current constitution, already introduced 
some derogations from uh, the uh, rule of law. And this, in the end, led to the creation of the rule of law. But this does not mean that the rule of law is 100% um, in force. Constitutionalism is Ill underway, so to speak, in my country. Um, it's not really complete yet. Well, now we'd like to talk about a lady in Turkey. Our republic is founded on three main principles, citizenship, equality, and laity. An enlarged uh, citizenship is uh, fundamental because there is this principle of equality and laity is not conceivable without this principle of uh, citizenship based on equality. Laity in Turkey has been constitutionalized in 1937. At the moment, laity is part of all the part of the Constitution that cannot be modified. Article 24 of our Constitution states that it is uh, that uh, religion cannot be um, used for political purposes. So uh, the Religion cannot be uh, used for political purposes. This is clearly stated in the Constitution. We criticize our uh, government uh, that, is, uh, that has gained power a few years ago because it is uh, using religion for political purposes, for its own political purposes. So, laity is not um, in danger in Turkey. It is something that uh, is already guaranteed not only at constitutional level but also within society. It is nevertheless a fragile principle. In order to understand it, we need to understand our current political regime. In Turkey, just like in Italy, our political regime is a parliamentary regime. Parliamentary regime was created, established by the Ottoman Empire gradually but our uh, current constitution consolidated the executive power. Recently, a reform modified the scrutiny of uh, the president of the republic until 2014, the president was elected by the parliament, just like in Italy. Last year, for the first time, the president of the republic was elected, just like in France, by the people. So, thanks to this change, our president of the republic Republic, Mr. Erdogan, is uh, trying to 
introduce a presidential regime or a separate presidential regime. The debate in Turkey at the moment focuses exactly on this topic. This is to say whether Turkey will have to uh, maintain its uh, parliamentary regime with the further democratization of its regime or whether Mr. Erdogan, together with his party, will introduce a presidential regime. So, let's say that on June the 7th, we had uh, uh, show elections and uh, Erdogan's party lost its majority. He uh, still needs uh, 18 members of parliament uh, to have a parliamentary majority. So we hope that uh, we will have uh, uh, another election soon uh, that could uh, guarantee absolute majority. So next elections will be in two months. I still have three minutes left. Well, I thought it was four, actually. So let's um, try and have a look at the situation in Turkey and the role of Turkey with reference to the Mediterranean basin and what's the current situation. So. So, Turkey in the constitutional time and space. As our colleague, uh, my colleagues uh, said, when uh, speaking about constitutionalism, I will not uh, dwell too long on this. But I will uh, rather dwell on, focus on some uh, characteristics of uh, contemporary constitutions. A constitution is the autobiography of a people. Is this true? Maybe constitutions can be seen as a way to achieve freedom. Then a third characteristic of constitutions, of contemporary constitutions, is that there is a uh, uh, checks and balances as a system well I really in my work I really study these uh, check and balances mechanisms so and uh, we try to understand how the contemporary constitution can introduce this kind of mechanism at different levels in order to guarantee a balance and a distribution of power and a balance between the state and society. In the Mediterranean Basin, We also use or we can apply the term transconstitutionalism, constitutionalization of a territory on the one hand and territorialization of constitutions on the other. So just to make things clearer, the uh, Barcelona Convention with the participation of a uh, Tunisia, Turkey, and Italy, among others, can offer an important tool in terms of constitutionalization of a 
region, a territory, because its purpose is to create an integrated e area that deserves to be protected within the Mediterranean Basin. So, uh, well, uh, we can actually talk about uh, Mediterranean constitutionalism, constitutionalism. Well, maybe it's too, too soon to speak about Mediterranean constitutionalism, but uh, there is a, a constitutionalization process in the Mediterranean area. And this started, this process started in 2010. From Egypt to Maghreb in Tunisia. Well, we have two different constitutional mechanisms. There is uh, the constitutional justice, which gives the constitution its uh, legal value, and then there is transconstitutionalism, which can help us introduce this concept of uh, constitutionalism in the Mediterranean basin. Constitutional courts uh, can find uh, the right solutions to Problem to similar problems. They can find similar solutions to similar problems. And this uh, can apply to a Christian society, to an Islamic society, a Muslim society, even to a lay or uh, society. Even if, well, if there are uh, similar problems, the constitutional courts can find uh, similar solutions. So, constitutional justice seems to be uh, the um, pillar of constitutionalism and the, the constitutional process in the Mediterranean Basin. In order to have a constitutional justice that is really our garden, the garden of our rights, we need to accept the idea of a constitutional coexistence of all the freedom and rights, environmental, social, economic rights, just as the um, Constitution of Tunisia did. A constitution needs to meet the needs of uh, the judges and uh, guarantee their uh, independence. National institutions needed to be accessible to uh, people who were uh, who have seen their freedom violated, abused. So that's why we have uh, in Turkey uh, the individual appeal to justice. So we uh, guarantee the respect to the safeguard of human rights. What's the difference between uh, Turkey and other uh, and Middle East countries? Just one more minute, please. Uh, Tunisia and Egypt try to guarantee um, a political um, alternation and uh, they were well they, in Turkey was as I started doing as I started doing this in 1950 in Turkey we have a clear division between uh, uh, spiritual power and state power constitution is a lay uh, text not a spiritual text And this is extremely important for Turkey. To conclude, I'd like to stress the importance of this uh, double dimension of democracy. Democracy cannot be limited to a majority democracy.
democracy needs to be pluralistic. Majority democracy has some technical aspects, but uh, a pluralistic democracy is more of a, a, an ethic value. So if we accept that uh, human rights are really the uh, legislative infrastructure of democracy, we need to accept also that uh, there are uh, these two dimensions of democracy. Thank you for your attention. And finally, the floor goes to our colleague, Professor Sharif. Thank you very much. I, th I think if I remain seated in this um, comfortable seat, I'm going to fall to sleep in a minute. So uh, I propose that I go to the podium. <laughs> And also, I promise you not to exceed 20 minutes, if not less. Very good. Um, first of all, I'm very thankful to the chair of this session, uh, my fellow colleagues of this distinguished panel. I have really benefited a lot from being part of this uh, uh, great panel. I'm also I'm also uh, very humbled to be invited to this uh, a, a great meeting that brings me back to a, a country that I've always adored and loved. And going back in the memory lane, uh, there are so many memories that are associated with this place. So I'm very happy to be back in Italy. Well, I mean, a, a, I think the whole discussion today, for me at least, is somehow misplaced because we are dealing with a fundamentally important issues that have to do with constitutionalism, religion, Islam in particular, and public participation within this scale. Reflected on the Arab Spring for sure. And these issues are a bit complicated and sophisticated when it comes to a liberated discussion. Well, and therefore, perhaps, uh, I mean, we might agree or disagree on the points made. And each one of us has his own view, and these views have to be respected by others. But we still we're within this multiplicity of opinion have the right to express our own views on that. And definitely it's not fair, neither for me nor for my fellow colleagues, uh, uh, to have such arrangements because time is a bit tight and none of us would be able really uh, to, uh, to, to, to brief you uh, uh, about really the whole topic. Bearing in mind that we are supposedly using very simple language in order to have access to all those who are present here today, some of them, as I have been briefed, are not experts in the topic, so we have to simplify the terminology used at the uh, easiest way. But I mean, I might sum up all these discussions into two main topics. One of them would be the, the future of the Arab Spring, if it's going to be a future for this movement. And the second, and, uh, which is the most important one, uh, uh, and we have to be clear about that, is really Islam a threat? Should we lock uh, uh, to Islam from all these aspects, even from the constitutional uh, experience, uh, the, uh, the threat that cannot be accommodated within Western culture? 
I'll just start with the first topic uh, about the Arbus prank, because I've seen that some of us today have doubt that there were Arbus prank, and uh, I've, uh, I have heard even that there perhaps there were sort of Tunisian sprang, not Arab sprang, and then it spread it over the way. Uh, a view that I, I respect but cannot confirm, simply because we owe the whole process to, to Tunisia. Tunisia is a, the country that really started the process, and many other countries followed that within the Arab region. I recall back in January 2011. By mid-January, I was in, at the uh, Dead Sea in Jordan attending a meeting for Yale Law School. And I had a colleague, we were watching the events that erupted in Tunisia, seeing the guy being killed, uh, 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 killing himself, and the people going out to the street and the revolt, and finally, the departure of uh, the pre president Zinedine Ali. And at this very particular point, I remember this guy who, I mean, a colleague of mine, Shabli Malat from uh, uh, Salt Lake City Law School saying, coming to the meeting and quoting this famous uh, uh, Tunisian uh, 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 Kurt uh, of uh, the famous Tunisian Shari um, Tunisi, Abu Qasim Shabi, when he said, "Is a Shab who on a road of life, so he must be able to give up power," which means if people are determined, if people are determined to to, to have their own life, this destiny will definitely respond positively. And the question that poses itself at this very particular moment, so it seems that our, our fellow Tunisian people have been successful in doing that. But was something like that be of the same success if it takes place in another country, let's say Egypt? And the answers that came at this very particular moment by everybody attending our meeting, and those are very highly intellectual experts of political science. The answer came, no. This can never happen in Egypt. And why is that? Because everybody was aware how oppressive the system, the political system is, and how toughly they would really combat and respond to any popular activities in the street. Ten days later, the Egyptian people started really going out into the street, and within three days, they changed the shape of not only of their country, but the whole history of the region. I mean, perhaps they, at first, they imitated the Tunisian uh, model, but later, they intensified, intensified the experience and come up with something unique. Still, at the beginning, none of us in Egypt believed what happened, what was happening, what had happening, because we are all convinced that the regime is so powerful. And the regime maybe is tolerant for a day or two, but after three days, they will really take control uh, and oppress all these people and think it would be back on track. To the extent I was really receiving myself phone calls from colleagues all over the world, worried about me, checking on me, uh, and what is really happening within these three days. And my answer definitely was really, I don't know. But it seems to me still that the regime will take over again and again. 
then the miracle happened and the downfall of the regime at the whole took place and people won the battle. But why did they do that? Simply, I mean, because Egyptian, if I'm talking about Egyptian now, have suffered a lot. Not for decades, but, but for centuries. When I go down there on the Egyptian history since the pharaonic period up till this very moment, under the different dynasties, there were sort of continuing oppression that has been exercised by one dynasty after the other. And until we've reached what we have reached after what's called the 1952 revolution, when we had sort of have a democratic system of government in theory with an oppressive really regime in practice. So you would have a very fine constitution, beautifully, beautifully written. You read the constitution, you said, wow, what is that? I mean, oh, human rights are protected. Uh, we have yeah, really three equal branches of government. There is a check and balance, and each one of them is responsible before the others. So what else do you want? But the reality is, it's not about the text. It's about how you enforce this text. And here comes the role of the judges and the judiciary. Because judges, I mean, we have seen in comparative judicial experiences throughout the world, that they are the ones that they tell us what the constitution is. It's not the dead letters that we read it in the paper. So, and this is what we've gone through. We had these beautiful documents, nonetheless, they were not in force. I mean, uh, they were suspended, a, 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 a destroyed by a sort of enabling legislation and emergency decrees. Uh, so the theory is something and the practice is something else. And certainly under such circumstances, the idea of having a political ambitious did not exist. We didn't have anybody in this country that would dream of being something at the political level. Because this was the domain of a very special, distinct group. And they wouldn't allow anybody to get into that. So the average human being would never think about really having a role to play in the political life, which, leads, which led people at the very end to be disinterested. disinterested in their, not only political thinking, but in their whole country. Because whatever we're going to happen is not going to be rewarded. And therefore, just give it up, give it up, give it up. Well, again, until the, the miracle happened and people have seen the change, and they become in control. And what followed after that, the consequences of developments that I wouldn't be able to cover them right now. But I would leave, I would leave the, 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 the answer to the question, which is the continuation of the Arab Spring. What is the future of the Arab Spring? I'll leave it for now. I'll come back by the end of my talk in five or six minutes. Now, what about the threat of Islam? Is really Islam a threat? Well, most of us, I mean, do not know what we really mean when we talk about Islam. And there is a stereotype approach and a really misconception about this. That Whenever you talk about Islam, you, what comes to your mind is this terrorist, the violence, um, oppression of people's rights, especially women, inequality. 
and you name them. A lot of really criticisms that people have used to really attribute to this religion. But what we have to know now when you talk about Islam is not really just a religion. It's a, you're talking about a comprehensive, a comprehensive system that is indeed established or founded on a religious basis. And those religious bases are the God's commands. Yeah, you know, people are, by their very nature, are very religious. And most of us, if not all of us, you really believe in God. And if you believe in God, you have to follow God's commands. And when it came to Islam, the whole concept is if God gave us this life, he has set up a system, this is a Sharia, and this Sharia there to regulate our affairs when we deal with each other as individuals, and when we deal with the state, and when we deal with God. So the really devotional part and transactional part that is have to be observed. But still, the problem is that we cannot easily identify what these rules are. Because when, if God gave out the, the holy book, as he gave out the, the tradition of the prophet, those are not, they are, I mean, unique, but they are not comprehensive, and they cannot cover everything. And therefore, our mission as a human being to search for the role, the rule, the rule, that God wants us to apply in a specific situation. And we examined that through different sources and different practices to arrive to the right conclusion. Apparently, not everybody is entitled to do this job. And uh, definitely, the conclusion that people who, even who those who are entitled to do the job rich, could be controversial. And this is a mercy of God. This is definitely a mercy of God. This shows you that people differ. And their, I mean, assessment does differ as well. And therefore, uh, what uh, we might agree upon today could disagree tomorrow. And therefore, things have to develop in terms of place and time. And therefore, this uh, bunch of rules that Islamic, uh, let's say, Islamic law now uh, have developed over time are indefinite, meaning that they could be changed. If you are deprived from, from doing this today, you might be permitted to do it tomorrow. Simply because there are factors, factors have to be taken into account in order to reach this conclusion. And therefore we, therefore we do have a very uh, 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 flexible, flexible system that is really able to develop and be uh, 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 responding to the people need at any time and in any place. Well, a lot to be said about this process of developing the law under Islam and what does the law mean. But, but the final object in this is to do what is right and refrain from doing the wrong. It's the same concept that all the divine revelation have called the for. Definitely all monotheistic faces and divine revelation are agree in agreement without a single exception. That is, this has to be done in this way and this has, should not be done that way. And therefore even when you talk about Islam, you're talking about the continuity of other divine revelation. 
It's unbelievable because these rules mostly go in the same way that other religions have gone through. And you won't be surprised to learn that even in certain areas where an Islam is usually attacked, these areas are derived, and the rule itself is derived from either the Old or New Testament. Like, I mean, nowadays there have always been claimed that Islam permit polygamy for sure. But if you study polygamy history, you would find the sources there in the Old Testament. Apparently, there was really a movement afterwards that developed the whole thing to abolish, to abolish it at some point, but the roots are there. And there are certain sects up till today, they still practice it. Apostasy and punishment and others. I mean, also, all these arrangements were there at the Old Testament when they stoned those non believers even though it's not the case in Islam because, I mean, the agreement of the scholars today that apostasy is no longer a crime under Islamic law. Anyway, we are talking about a very sophisticated system of law. And if it is really sophisticated in that sense, we should not look at it as a threat. It's a system that is really compatible well, other contemporary system and could be accommodated within this framework. It's about us as those people who work in comparative studies to see what are the similarities and what are the dissimilarities and try to come up with a final assessment that is really true and just. Now, what is the future of the Arab Spring? I stopped there when I said, like, yeah, be careful about the constitution, be careful about the constitution. It's not only about the constitutional text. So if you really manage to develop a good constitutional text, this is not the end of the problem. It might be the beginning of the problem. Especially within the Arab, I mean, most of the uh, Arab uh, uh, Spring countries, they have gone through disastrous experiences really uh, 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 making up their constitution. We've seen, we've seen really dramatic experiences both in Afghanistan and in uh, Iraq. Uh, I mean, we're in the, the, our good friends in the U.S., I mean, provided them with the expert to draft their colleagues. And he, here you come up with this beautifully written documents that I mean, you'll be very, very happy with that, but has nothing to do with the real environment. It's not enough to watch us on TV. Remember, it's not enough to watch us on TV. Come live with us to feel our pain, to see the problems we are going through. And when you feel that, you might be able to develop a rule that is really compatible with our circumstances. And this is what is mess, missing on some of these constitutional documents. And again, as I told you, it is left to the judiciary of these countries. The judiciary of these countries is the final arbitrator that they're going to tell us at some point whether this is a, a valid, successful constitutional experience or not. Do not pay enough attention to the text. Watch the judiciary. And in that sense, I believe that the struggle is still going on in those countries. Apparently, there's so many difficulties. Yeah, whatever people have achieved, it has been achieved, and it is quite progressive in any one of these countries we're talking about, whether we're talking about Tunisia, Egypt, and maybe beyond. Uh, and perhaps we cannot know for sure what the future is going to hold out for us, 
but at least we do have expectation for a, bit, a better future. And because people today, people today are not as they used to be yesterday, they used to be very negative. Now they, now they have become aggressively calling for their rights and freedoms. And this is an, a really a very positive point that would definitely lead them to have access to a much better future. And at this point, I really conclude my uh, presentation. And I'm uh, very thankful to, to you all. And I'll be very happy to receive any questions. Thank you. Since we are a bit late, I'd just like to stress one point which is essential. Every time we try to judge this situation in a concrete way, we realize that it is not possible to simplify reality. Reality is more complex than we, what we might imagine. Three countries that we often put together within a, a single uh, um, definition actually have uh, three different uh, constitutional and institutional traditions and uh, histories. Uh, it is not enough to have a constitution stating many different uh, uh, rights uh, to really have these rights. What is really decisive is what is uh, underneath the uh, Constitution. So society needs to really share and experience these values and rights. And this is the future of these people. We have actually seen what it means to not only speak about a certain topic, but uh, listen to people that uh, experience firsthand a certain situation and express uh, their uh, thoughts uh, and uh, tell us their experience. So this is really a very important opportunity that we receive here in Rimini to go beyond uh, the surface of uh, problems and to realize that uh, these countries need to develop their potential. All the speakers that are here tonight uh, really suffer for from the uh, consequences of uh, uh, the uh, statement for freedom. So I'd really like to thank them all uh, with a big, a big applause for their participation, their contribution tonight. Thank you. Just uh, one last thing before you go to dinner. I'd like to remind you that uh, there is uh, this fundraising campaign that still goes on, as you know. The economic situation is not easy for anyone and also for uh, the organization uh, of the meeting. You can donate in uh, uh, pavilion C1C5A3. You can donate to support uh, the meeting so that uh, it, the meeting can still uh, be organized independently. Thank you. Good evening. Good night.